We completed the chapter on numerical methods and this is the summary of that chapter. But here I want to provide the big picture summary, not the details, not equations or any such details. My hope is the content of the next few slides would permanently stay with you so you can use it in a very practical sense. That's my goal here. So this is going to become one busy slide, even though it looks empty. But the big picture is we are trying to see how the two methods, the finite difference method that we did and the finite element method that we did, how do they fit together in the big scheme of solving an equation? Okay, so recall that we used one of the many differential equations in engineering. That's the heat equation. Okay, so in your differential equations class, you actually solved this heat equation. And you solved it, let's say, for a slab and for a constant boundary temperature and an initial temperature that is uniform throughout the slab, you solved it exactly and you got this analytical solution. Okay, that gives temperature at any position and at any time. Okay, but we will see that these are really big restrictions to have just constant initial temperature everywhere, or especially if the boundary temperatures to be constant and being a perfect slab, we, there's a lot of restrictions, okay? Um, so what we did in these two numerical methods, and let me show you the first one, um, which is the finite difference method. And in that method, we took, uh, the, the slab and we divided the slab into nodes and we're going to only solve at the nodes, not everywhere. Likewise, we are going to choose time steps and solve at certain times, not all times, not like here that uh, in the analytical solution that it, the solution was there for all time. We're not going to do that. And then we take this derivative term and we simply write it in terms of finite difference. So del T del T can be written approximately as T at T plus delta T minus T at T over delta T, okay? I promise to not show much equation, but that's maybe the, the only exception that you'll see. So I am approximating the derivative this way, okay? And then we get an algebraic equation that looks like this, okay? That looks like this. So if I change both this derivative and this derivative using this kind of uh, difference uh, equation that are approximation. We're going to eventually get uh, the equation like that. And then there will be an equation for every point. So I'll have one for, and so we'll have a set of equations and then we'll solve it. Okay, so likewise, for the other method, so that was the finite difference method. For the other method, what I'm going to do is again divide the entire region into elements. So elements are uh, two, let's say we have a two noded element. So we have two nodes and the space in between together, it makes an element. And I divide this entire region into elements and there, what I do 
is I also choose time stepping in exactly the same way as the previous method. And then I get an approximate solution over the element. I say, for example, oh, within the element, it just varies linearly. That's my assumption. That's my approximation. But of course, it doesn't work with just any approximation. Then I have to minimize the error. And by minimizing the error, I get an algebraic equation for one element, just like before we have an algebraic equation. And then we get equations for every set of or a set of equations for every element and and looks something like this okay where we have the unknowns and then the right hand side everything is known so we have a set of equations so we solve the set of equations using also the boundary condition and this is my finite element method that we did and the other one being finite difference, but look, it kind of follows uh, the, the, the big, in the big picture, it follows the same kind of process that we divide the space and the time and get some sort of an approximate uh, solution. And then we get a set of algebraic equation. The big thing I want you to see that instead of this differential equation that can look scary, we now have simply a set of algebraic equation. It's the same kind of equations that we solved in, in uh, middle school, for example. And uh, so except that it may not be a three by three equation, it may be a three million by three million equation. That's a different story, but it's, the, it's now changed this guy this equation can be converted into a numerical, a, a set of algebraic equations using finite difference or finite element. And then you just solve that set of algebraic equation. I just said that uh, this is something we are familiar with. We, we know how to solve. And, and then once you have solved this, then you interpolate. So in this uh, finite difference, for example, you solve at the nodes, and if you need something in between, you interpolate. There is something similar here, except the interpolations are built in. But the main idea is you now interpolate, and that gives you solutions everywhere. So you're able to solve this equation in by changing it to set of algebraic equation and that gives a lot of flexibility, which we'll discuss in a second. So that way of approximating the derivative into numerical methods, it just gives a tremendous flexibility. And that's what makes them very powerful. That's why we are talking about these methods in a course called computer-aided engineering because computer-aided engineering works with real-world problems and real-world problems need a lot of flexibility. So, uh, for example, what kind of flexibility? So here, the, the geometry doesn't have to be this nice slab. In fact, here is a... a um, geometry that's being used in this year's project, this being 2021, in one of the groups. And you can see how complex the geometry is. And the software is, a, we are able to uh, handle this and the method can fundamentally handle this. What are other things? The boundary condition, for our analytical solution, this guy had to be constant. Now, the boundary condition can change with time any way it wants. We just need the values. So it's flexible that way. Then the initial condition can also be anything in a 
similar manner and the properties can vary any way you want and the other thing is in geometry not only it can be anything it can change with time this slab can shrink it can shrink with time and we can still handle because we are only solving at one time step and if the next time step this thing is shrunk so all those nodes are shrunk I just need to know what is my current size that's all in that step and so I can include um, any kind of change over time so this flexibility comes with a price we cannot use these methods as much of a black box that we probably used for analytical solution when we use analytical solutions unless we make mistakes we get the um, answer not here not at all we can have everything done right and get garbage they are highly error prone these methods are highly error prone it they can be inaccurate and worse yet they can be unstable and give complete garbage they are not guaranteed not guaranteed uh, yet yet for most engineering problems the finite element is the king or the queen is it is the method of choice it is used for pretty much all kinds of physics that you can think of it is the most uh, popular software and it's used heavily okay that's why we have it in this class so how is it that this method this particular method finite element method is so popular for solving engineering problems even though it has those restrictions we can see one way that is even though the error in this needs to be carefully controlled as the point we just made it can be controlled it can be controlled by having more nodes for example that will reduce the special uh, the error in spatial discretization and also we can take smaller time step that also reduces error but of course a little downside more computing resources are needed more time more memory and so on but this is more easily available always so these errors can be controlled and controlling alone does not give does not guarantee accuracy in a practical sense so we have to eventually compare with experiment so for pretty much all real world problems before we are 100 percent sure we pretty much have to compare with experiment so by doing these we keep the errors possible errors in check in these methods and that's how it really you know we are able to use all the flexibility and it becomes it became so popular that this is used for pretty much all engineering uh, problems so from time and time again I have seen you know we tend to think well you know it's not really my uh, problem you know that's the solution the software gave so it's like software's problem when you accept results it is your solution results are yours not your softwares so here is one quote of course a very general one and another one that I really really want you to take note is regardless of what you use we are eventually responsible for the results 
So you have to, th this may sound like obvious, this may sound trivial, but we do this all the time. We would look at some results and say, oh yeah, I don't know, uh, that's what Comsol gave me. That's not acceptable. It, if we accept any kind of results from any software, then it's our results. And unless we can verify and validate in our mind that yes, these results make sense, we should not accept results from computational software because of all the way things can be inaccurate or things can go wrong. Thank you.